This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and here we are again. Another month has gone by and another astrological sign has become active. What does that mean? Well, it depends on who you ask. In my opinion, it's ridiculous to think that being born under a specific constellation could have any impact on your life whatsoever. But there are some folks out there who you can usually identify by their straight jackets and dream catchers that claim the story of your life is dictated by where certain celestial objects are located when you're born. That's why when you're in the early early stages of dating someone and they ask what time you were born, you should just drop them and focus on yourself, bro. Unfortunately, my wife and I were already married by the time she asked me that, so legally, I can't run away. In all seriousness though, while there are some aspects of astrology that I can only describe as absolute woo-woo, there are some undeniably fascinating things about it, like the mythological stories explaining how these constellations ended up in the sky and the archetypes they supposedly represent. In fact, that is exactly what I'm talking about in today's episode episode about Leo. Before I get into it though, I do want to say a real quick thank you to this week's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. The fact that you clicked on this video shows that like me, you're a curious person, someone who likes to learn new things and expand your worldview. And that means Curiosity Stream was basically made for you. You can think of it as Netflix for nerds or Hulu for history buffs. It's the streaming service for people who want to know more about the world, everything from technology, history, true crime, science, and so much more. They've got everything from the real Game of Thrones to Stephen Hawking's favorite places to inside stories about your favorite bands. And since we're friends, I can offer you a discount. Go to curiositystream.com slash John Solo to pay just $14.99 for a year-long membership or use code John Solo at checkout. 365 days of unlimited learning for just $15? Kings used to start wars for that kind of knowledge. Best not let this opportunity go to waste. And we're back. So without further ado, let's dive in. Starting with the very basics, Leo is the fifth sign in the zodiac and is active from July 23rd to August 22nd. This place is the fire sign between Cancer, whose element is water, and Virgo, whose element is earth. The name Leo is Latin for lion, but the only way I can picture this symbol representing a lion is if the circle is its butt and the squiggly line is its tail. So if any astrology buffs in the audience want to tell me if I'm right in the comments, I'd greatly appreciate it. Now when it comes to the constellation itself, it may look exactly like a swan, but it too represents a lion. Which lion specifically we'll get into later, but first I want to briefly talk about what it means means to be born under Leo. As you may expect, because the lion is considered king of the beasts, Leos are also said to be kingly and dominating. They're fiery, independent, and highly skilled individuals with a burning passion to prove themselves. In fact, the challenge for Leos is often in taming their own inner beasts, because if they solely acted through their emotions and instincts, they would rip the heads off anyone who stood in their way. Now, if you saw last month's episode about cancer, you may remember that one of its major focal points was its association with the mother. Well, to Leos, the almighty archetype is the father, which may explain why Zeus is considered its godly ruler, despite the sun being its planetary ruler. Which, by the way, is the byproduct of ancient civilizations determining that Leo was active during the hottest month of the year, similar to how Cancer, which is active in July, is ruled by our second most powerful celestial heat source, the moon. And speaking of the ancients, let's move on to the myths they associated with the constellation, because this is always my favorite part. So one of the interesting things about Leo is that it's one of the oldest recognized constellations, meaning there's evidence that the Mesopotamians had a similar constellation as early as 4000 BCE. And the Sumerians, the very earliest civilization found in Mesopotamia, may have associated Leo with a terrifying monster from their mythology called Humbaba the Terrible. And wait until you get a load of this thing. First mentioned in the second tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Humbaba was a monstrous beast that guarded the cedar forest where the gods live. Humbaba was raised by Utu, the sun, and given his guard assignment by Enlil, god of earth, wind, and storms. He's said to have had a lion's face and a look of death. He also had the front paws of a lion with the back claws of a vulture. His body was covered in thorny scales and on his head were the horns of a bull. Humbaba's roar is a flood, his mouth is death, and his breath is fire. He can hear leaves rustling in a forest a hundred leagues away, which made him a very successful head of security. Oh, and I can't forget his dick and tail, which both ended in a snake's head and resulted in Humbaba being a perma virgin. To make it even worse, Humbaba is said to have seven tears that he can unleash on his victims. We aren't 
told exactly what these tares are, but when Gilgamesh travels to the cedar forest with his 50 men to harvest its wood and bring it home, Umbaba interrupts the heist by causing the would-be thieves to writhe on the ground in fear and pain. You wouldn't expect anyone to put up much of a fight against such a monstrous beast, but Gilgamesh tricks Umbaba into giving up his seven tares in exchange for gifts and friendship. Then Gil calls to the god Shamash, another name for Utu who raised Umbaba, to strike the unarmed monster with 13 powerful winds which knock him on his ass, and before you know it, the once proud guardian is begging Gilgamesh for mercy. Initially, Gil considers letting him up because he likes the idea of turning Humbaba into his companion, but then Enkidu shows up and says, what are you doing? Kill him already. So he does. Just like how Perseus did to Medusa, Gil cuts off Humbaba's head and places it in a bag before going on his journey home. So what do you say? Should I do a full episode on the Epic of Gilgamesh? Now, sometime after the Sumerians came the Babylonians, who called Leo the Great Lion. And while there's no myth explaining why, it is a convenient way to transition to Greek mythology in which it was also said to be a lion. Specifically, Leo was the Nemean Lion, a murderous creature that was raised by the goddess Hera for the sole purpose of terrorizing the residents of the Nemean Hills, and most importantly, killing Heracles. So, when Heracles is assigned his first labor by King Eurystheus, Theus, he's told he must slay the Nemean lion and bring back its hide, a feat that many wannabe heroes before him tried to accomplish and failed miserably. Well, not that it needs to be said, but Heracles wasn't like any other hero, so he set off to find the beast and after 30 days was able to track down its lair. He waited a few hours for the lion to show up, aimed his bow and arrow, and took his shot, only for the arrow to bounce right off because the lion's hide was impervious to any kind of weapon. In the way that Heracles gets around this little obstacle, depends on the version. In one variant, the lion leaps at the hero who swings his club downward and right onto his head, leaving it considerably concussed. In a different variant, the lion retreats to its cave when it's attacked and Heracles, being an excellent tactician, blocks up one of the cave's two entrances with a boulder, so the lion's only way out is through him. Then, once he's inside, he wrestles it into submission, locks his arms around its throat, and chokes it to death, just like before. Now, as impressive as it would be, Heracles didn't get away from this encounter without a scratch. In most tellings, he lost his finger, which the locals built a tomb for. The funny thing is, the tomb had a lion engraved on it, which I'm sure the finger would not appreciate. That'd be like if I died from an overdose of bad music and someone carved Billie Eilish on my tombstone. Though it's interesting to note that one of the Greek poets claims that this event is where the tradition of putting lions on the tombs of important people came from. I don't know about you, but I find that really fascinating. The fact that even back in the days of ancient Greece, they were debating about the significance and origins of certain symbols, just like we do today. And just like us, they were probably wrong. Anyway, after Heracles killed the lion, he followed Athena's advice and used its claw to cut through its own impenetrable hide, which the hero would go on to wear like a suit of armor. Then he went back to King Eurystheus while wearing the lion's hide, and the king was so terrified by Heracles' power that he banned the demigod from coming into the city anymore and said he had to show his trophies from outside the city walls. And get this, the king had a large bronze jar made for him to hide in whenever Heracles came around doesn't get much more pathetic than that. As for the constellation, similar to the crab from last month's episode, Hera was disappointed in the lion's failure, but she appreciated his effort to please her, so she rewarded it by placing it in the stars as the constellation Leo. And that, my fellow mythology nerds, was the messed up mythology of Leo. If you don't know, now you know. If you made it to this point, I'd first like to say thank you very much, and I'd second like to say do all the things. Comment your thoughts about what you learned from this episode, and if you're a Leo, tell me. Do you think my sources gave an accurate assessment of you, or were they wrong? After that, I would greatly appreciate if you hit those like and subscribe buttons, because those are excellent ways to support the channel. And if you want to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, or have a backup way of being notified when I upload, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. I'll see you all again early next week with the Messed up mythology of hypnos until then my name is john solo and remember john shot first mm -hmm.